So real quick before we get started, welcome. Come on in. There's plenty of seats up front. <laughs> no, everyone loves to sit up front. So one of the things that the partners of Media Current says is that uh, Dave, he's back there in the back, a little shout out to him. He says, it doesn't happen unless you took a picture. So I'm going to take a little picture, get a little uh, after lunch snoozy wave for us. Ready? One, two, three. <laughs> not there we not go. one. Woo! That's all right. <laughs> Anyhow, all right, guys, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome. We're really glad you're here. Welcome to Meeting Marketing Challenges with Automation and Drupal. We have a lot of great lead, genera lead generation, web personalization, and just overall marketing ROI information to share with you. We have a lot to share, so we're going to breeze through some of it, and feel free to follow up with us afterwards on specific things that maybe is um, a, a pain point within your organization. Come by our booth. We're giving you market automation demos. We're going to talk a little bit more about lead strategy and kind of uh, you know, putting some best practices into place. But I think we have some great uh, things to share with you today. I'm, I'm Adam Wade, Marketing Director at Media Current, and I'm joined up here with Jay Calicott, um, our Lead Architect and Product Manager. And we're really excited to have one of our marketing automation partners, Atlanta-based Silver Pop, an IBM company, uh, Bobby Drummond, from the, uh, he's a Strategic Alliance Manager at, at uh, Silver Pop. I'll let him introduce himself a little bit more in just a few minutes. But um, just a little bit about Media Current. We build highly impactful, elegantly designed Drupal websites. So we focus on digital strategy, development, and design. Here's just a few of the customers that we work with. Um, we're migrating the weather channel, weather.com, onto Drupal. There's actually a session later today, I believe it's at 2 o'clock. We're going to talk about the full migration and kind of the ins and outs of that. Turner, Turner Broadcasting, NASCAR, Georgia.gov, just to name a few. We also have um, a specific specialization in content strategy, marketing automation strategy, and integration. We wrote the only marketing automation in Drupal ebook. You can stop by our booth if you'd like to you know, get a copy of that. We're also featured in the recent, uh, recently released marketing automation for dummies, our own case study around successful lead generation and content strategy and conversion optimization uh, was featured in that. So you're certainly welcome to come by and get a copy of that as well. We organize monthly meetups. Uh, we maintain most of the marketing automation in Drupal modules, which we'll go over in just a few minutes. And, um, we have over 30 or 40 resources on our website. So if there's specific things that your organization is looking for as far as setting up a lead scoring grading model, um, conversions, database segmentation, there's a ton of resources on our website that can help arm your organization with some of that. Um, so just a little bit about what we're going to cover today. We're going to give a quick overview of marketing automation, kind of what it is. Uh, how many of you are, have never really heard of marketing automation before? This, no? Okay. Good. How many of you do not have market automation but are considering it? Okay. And how many of you are using it now um, for maybe at least a year or so or more? Okay, great. So we hope to have information in this session for all of you. For those of you that maybe haven't heard of it, give you an overview. For those of you that are considering it or have been using it, maybe just signed the contract for the past six months or so, give you some information to kind of take that strategy to the next level. And then for those of you that have been using it for a while, to really take some things uh, to propel your, your, your efforts and your strategy there. Um, we're also going to, Silverpop's going to uh, do a little demo of their Engage product and talk about web personalization. And then Jay, kind of the mastermind behind some of the integration, will talk through what does it specifically look like to integrate a marketing automation platform into your Drupal website and have it all tie together and seamlessly. Does that make sense? Good there? Okay. So, how does it work? So, I'm a storyteller. I have two children. Um, my son is six and my daughter is two, and I tell them stories all the time. Unfortunately, this is how they look most of the time when I tell them the stories. So, um, my son is not going to be happy that I put that up there. But um, <laughs> hopefully, I know you guys just had lunch. It's a little cool and dark in here. Hopefully, none, none of you will look like that. But uh, if they do, Jay's going to come out and run around the audience. So, <laughs> um, so here's the story. So, I want you to meet Joe Blue. Joe lives in Blue Ridge, Georgia. He drinks Blue Moon beer. Any Blue Moon beer fans out there? <laughs> he, uh, for those of you that have kids, you, you know the show Blue's Clues. He actually owns the dog Blue. And Joe loves, on his Blue Ridge property, to grow Kentucky bluegrass. But the other day, Joe was sitting out there drinking his Blue Moon beer, and he noticed that he started having weeds pop up in his Kentucky bluegrass. Now, it's award-winning, so he's, he's frustrated that he's getting weeds popped up. So like m most people that have a problem, that he takes out his tablet, and he Googles weed control in Kentucky bluegrass. 
and he lands across to your website, your Drupal website. Got to say that. Got to throw that out there. Um, and so, let's role play for a second. Now you're the landscaping company. How many of you are small business owners in here? Okay, so you're the landscaping company. How do you get Joe's attention on your website and not just um, you know move him from just a casual visitor into a revenue generating customer? So the thing with marketing automation is we're going to take Joe from a cold lead that's on our website into a red hot lead ready for sales, fully qualified and engaged with your product and service. So Joe downloaded your white paper when he was on his website, on his tablet, on weed control for bluegrass, Kentucky bluegrass. And because you have marketing automation installed on your website, after he converted, you're now able to tell, and even if he hadn't converted, if he's an anonymous, anonymous visitor, you can still tell, you can tell where he's visiting on your website. So you saw that Joe not only looked at these tips on Kentucky bluegrass, but he also looked at organic products that's pet friendly um, to put on his grass, because he, you know, his little dog blue. So because you have market automation installed, you've now segmented him, you've created an automation rule, that puts him into a list of folks that are interested in organic products. So two days later, after he downloaded your white paper, you've now sent him an email that's personalized to some of his needs, without him even telling you about this, about you know growing Kentucky bluegrass, and here's some organic tips and tricks and things like that that's pet friendly. Then a few days later, because you know where Joe lives, either by tracking his IP address or because the information that he filled out on your form, you know that he lives in Blue Ridge, Georgia, which any of landscapers or gardeners I like to get out there, you know that Blue Ridge is in zone seven of the growing. So they have certain things that they need, uh, certain you know, weather requirements and certain fertilization stuff. So you send him information on best practices of a perfect bluegrass weed uh, yard in zone seven of the United States. So now what you're doing is you're engaging him with the information that's relevant to what his needs are and he gave you very minimal information, but because you've set up automation rules, you've segmented, segmented him in your database. So as Joe engaged with your website, with your email, maybe if you're B2C and you do a lot of SMS messages, or he went to a trade show, you're gradually warming Joe up. You're, you're creating rules that as he engages, you're scoring him higher and higher and higher. And at a score of 100, you pass him over to sales automatically. And so sales then has the information that they need to have a very qualified conversation. They know where Joe lives, they know his pain points, they know what activities he has, and so they can pick up the phone and talk intelligently about the information that Joe needs and can sell him on a monthly weed control service. Does that make sense, everyone? How's that, Joe Blue? Yeah. All right. And so I just wanted to tell you this as well. Like, it's not just email. So Joe is interacting with your website. So you're, through a marketing automation platform, you can then personalize the content on there. So not only is he getting information personalized on his email, and he's looking at it on his tablet, but when he comes back to your website, the information that he's seeing may be dynamically changing because of his needs or his interests. Okay. So show of hands again, those that you are considering marketing automation or, or just started using it, so what I want to do now is shift just a little bit, give, give a quick overview. For those of you that are considering it, I want to give you four things that you need to consider in your organization before actually purchasing a, a marketing automation platform. So the first thing is your lead management process. If you remember back to the diagram and I showed Joe was warming up from zero to 100 and then he was automatically passed over to sales 100, many marketers that we talk to, or many customers, um, they know who they, their leads are, and they, they're either passing all, every website visitor that comes, they're passing them over to sales, and then sales gets frustrated because they're getting all these unqualified leads, or they're falling through the cracks, and there's no automation, or there's no point at which a lead is then, process, or is then passed over to sales. So consider your lead management process and put together an actual chart or an actual diagram that shows as visitors come to our website and they engage, at what point and what information do we have to have that will then pass them over to sales to make a qualified lead? 
Um, and a lot of this can be automated, but the, the, I, my one suggestion to you guys is to, to sit down with your sales team, sit down with your marketing team, and actually diagram this out on the whiteboard. What does a lead look like? What is an ideal lead? What is it the information that we need to have? And at what point do, do you need, the sales need to have that to then uh, um, pick up the phone and give them a call? Consider your team's skills is number two. This one is, is, is big because marketing automation is not rocket science, right? You don't have to be a, a rocket scientist to get in there and set up campaigns and set up automation rules. It takes a little bit of a learning curve to learn, and each platform is very different. Um, but having a team that understands the sense of urgency around generating revenue and generating leads and knowing who your buyer personas are and actually taking a look at, okay, this person really gets lead generation on our team. We want them to kind of help facilitate and put together some lead generation campaigns. This person is really great at you just telling them to set up this specific um, uh, email campaign or drip campaign. So they're more on the technical. They like to just kind of have process. So consider your team's skills and know which person is best at what. And if you're one-man show, you know, thinking through, okay, like, I need to set up these specific campaigns, and I need to understand who my buyer personas are. So um, if that is a little bit unclear, I'd love to talk to you a little bit more about it. But just ensuring that you have the right team in place that can carry out uh, your market automation. OK, content strategy. This one is a big one. Uh, if you remember back to the story of Joe, we sent him information that was relevant to what his buying needs were. So again, it was Kentucky Bluegrass, organic materials, um, zones that he's at. So if you don't have a content strategy in place and you don't have your buyer personas identified, so who exactly is it that you're going after? What are their buying questions? What questions do they have during your buying cycle? And actually putting together content that speaks to those questions, you're not going to have a lot of information to automate. So it's great to purchase a marketing automation platform. It's great to implement one and integrate it with your website. But if you don't have a solid content strategy in place and producing the content to automate to these folks, you're going to be stuck with what I hear a lot of marketers. We've got a marketing automation platform, and we send out a newsletter once a month or once a quarter or something. But there's so much more that you can be doing with it and have a solid content strategy in place. And I just want to do a quick plug. Um, our senior digital strategist, Don, if you can wave your hand back there. Don is going to be doing a, if you want to learn more about content strategy, she has a session tomorrow at 1045. I would encourage you to attend that. She's going to give you a lot of great tips on putting together a solid ROI content strategy. And lastly, consider your overall team skills. So there's been a huge shift lately, which I think is, is great for marketers, is that marketing is, is seen less as you know, folks that are just producing uh, brochures and attending trade shows, but we actually are now having a seat at the decision um, making process in businesses because we're actually able to prove the ROI of the campaigns. So taking a look at your overall goals, how many leads is it that we need to have? How many leads do we have to pass over to sales? What is our revenue goal? Um, and ensuring all of that's in place as you start to implement a marketing automation platform I think is going to be key. So those are just four quick things. I wish I had more time to go into that, but I really wanted to pass it over to Bobby and talk a little bit more about uh, the Silver Pop Engage platform and uh, personalize this on the web. Bye. Thank you, Adam. No, I, I appreciate it. Adam did a fantastic job of, I think, highlighting some core fundamental elements of marketing automation. Uh, my portion of the presentation will probably be a little bit more focused on overall digital strategy. And just to kind of kick things off, so my name is Bobby Drummond. I'm a strategic alliance manager with Silver Pop, which is an IBM company. We were acquired by IBM um, about six weeks ago. So we're very excited to be going through uh, that transition into Big Blue. So I'm responsible for working uh, with a variety of our different technology vendors um, on joint go-to-market strategy and developing joint integrations that complement um, our marketing automation and behavioral marketing automation platform. So that helps explain the partnership that we have currently in place with Media Current. Um, so when we start to look at things kind of at a, at a much larger scale, and I know we have some individuals who are relatively new to marketing automation and are that in the evaluation stages, there's, some, there's a couple of core components that you want to look for in your digital strategy. There's really three of them that I'm going to talk about that I'm going to highlight that Silver Pop does really well, and that's something that we look at from our perspective. 
But when you look at kind of the, the manifesto that we put up there, what this is all about, and this is kind of just to echo off of what Adam talked about, is it's getting down to an audience of one. So being able to have, you know, if we take this room, for example, being able to have thousands of very different individualized one-to-one -one conversations because everyone in this room has very unique buying decisions. They have specific preferences. They have specific needs for their business. And if you, the marketer, aren't communicating in a fashion that allows your message to be tailored to that individual's approach, you need to rethink what you're doing from a digital marketing strategy perspective to be a little bit more effective. Um, to give you guys a little bit of background on who we work with, I know there's some people, if you ask 10 people, you'll get 10 different responses. A lot of people view Silverpop as an email service provider. Some would coin us as a marketing automation platform. Um, but in short, you know, we work with over 2,000 customers and over 5,000 brands, spanning a variety of different types of companies, enterprise to mid-market to startup, all the way from B2B high-tech companies to retail um, to uh, you know, travel and hospitality and things of that nature. So we're very proud of the portfolio of customers that we've assembled. And all of these customers have relied on us for this concept that we have coined uh, behavioral marketing automation, which is really a combination of collecting individual customer behaviors. Uh, it also leverages email marketing. But email marketing is so much more than just putting content um, just putting content together and sending a same message out to the entire audience. You need to use things such as enhanced personalization or dynamic content or leverage past purchase behavior in your emails to communicate effectively with your audience. So if we put together an email understanding that if you look at Adam's example with Joe, who has a family, who has a pet in Kentucky bluegrass, you want to be sending that email an individual that has dynamically populated content with stuff that is going to provide a solution to his particular challenge. Or maybe you're going to want to provide him with a link to download information on lawn care or handling certain types of lawn care issues with a, a Kentucky bluegrass, things of that nature. So you want to get very personalized in that respect with your email marketing. You need to take it um, at, a, at a much deeper level than just sending out the same message to everyone. The second component of your digital marketing strategy like Adam mentioned again, which is core to marketing automation, is lead to revenue, or what we also coin as lead to conversion. So it's the same concept. So if you're an individual and you stop by our Silver Pop trade show and you talk to me and you say, Bobby, I'm interested in marketing automation in conjunction with content management, but I don't have budget, I'm not going to be able to get it a seat at the decision-making table until six months, the last thing that I want to do is go and pass that lead along to my sales rep and have them reach out and try to begin a sales conversation. What we want to do is we want to bring you into the Engage platform, and I'll show you a slide of what that looks like, and slowly start to nurture you by just sending you relevant emails, personalized emails, over an extended period of time. And the goal behind that is that six months from now, when you are ready to engage Silver Pop and have a conversation and you have budget, and you're ready to execute on some of these initiatives, the concept behind that is that Silver Pop will be top of mind when you are ready to make that decision. So that's number two as far as a core element of a digital strategy. So you have email, you have marketing automation, lead to revenue, lead to conversion. The third component is something that, believe it or not, is new to a lot of different marketers. And obviously we're in this craze of, of big data, but I think the challenge that a lot of marketers have is what do we do with all of the data that's collected? And I'm going to just jump ahead here, and this kind of talks about it. So one of the business challenges that we help marketers solve is data in silos. So you have data in your CRM. You have data with your web analytics tool. Um, you have data in your e-commerce tool. So getting a 360-degree view of your customer can be a little bit challenging. And that's where Silver Pop, we kind of coined this phrase behavioral marketing automation because we are looking to tie in to all of those different systems, pull that, that data into our behavioral marketing automation platform so you, the marketer, can segment all of this data and get down to an audience of one to be able to effectively communicate to your customers. So going off of Adam's example, we talk about we want to identify and send an email, a nurture campaign to all individuals who have a dog, who have Kentucky bluegrass, who have run into issues 
um, with, with weeds or other lawn care maintenance type challenges. So maybe we want to send them the same content on how they can deal with those particular challenges or growing strategies or things of that nature. So that kind of tackles also the relevant content strategy. You know, the last thing you want to do, you don't want to send someone who's interested in Kentucky bluegrass. You know, you want to make, be very mindful of the content that you're sending them. So we'll talk about going back to the email marketing component of this. There are a lot of different things, and I'm not going to go through all 10 of these things that we have listed on what you can do to enhance a customer's email marketing experience. But some of the things that we can do in talking about leveraging data, when you're sending out an email, you know, using things such as personalization, just including someone's name in the subject line, or including dynamic, dynamic populated images. So if you're sending an email to a person that is located in Austin, Texas, you want to send them an image that is going to resonate with them here in the South. You're not going to want to send them an image of the Statue of Liberty or something like that when they live in Texas and they're interested in lawn care. So little things like that go a long way. Or if we look at it within the confines of this conference. So if you come to our booth and you ask to learn a little bit more about Silver Pop, one of the things that we could do is when we place you in a nurture program and we send you an email touching on the point of personalized content, Within the email, we could include downloadable links to some of the in, uh, topics of information that you requested to learn more about. And then we could also include a dynamic image of the sales rep in your territory, as well as that sales rep's contact information. So it makes it seem like it's a little bit more than an automated process and you actually have an individual that you can reach out to and speak to and answer any questions that you might have. So let's move on from the email part of it to the automation component, because I think that's one of the things that really makes Silver Pop unique. And automation is really just the idea that your marketing program, once you send off that initial round of communication, it's going to drive itself based on that particular individual's behavior. So in a lot of respects, this can be very easy. So if an individual that comes and is part of a nurture program, if we say we're going to send them a follow-up email after the conference within a week of the show, and then from there we're going to have our telesales, so we could set it up so we would have a decision diamond to say our telesales team, our insights field sales team, is going to reach out with a phone call to that individual, call that person, either yes, they want to begin a sales cycle, or no, they're not ready, or no, they're not interested. Based on how they handle those conversations and based on what their feedback is, that will determine automatically the appropriate communication track that they will be on within our automation engine. So then the final component, as we talked about, so the three things with your digital strategy, email marketing, marketing automation, and then leveraging customer behavior. As you embark on your evaluation process, you want to find a tool that's going to allow you to, again, pull in all of that data that right now might be currently siloed within your various, you know, all the components within your technology stack. So being able to pull out a rule set that says, I want to find all people that live in Austin, Texas, that have visited my website, that have downloaded a link on marketing automation and content strategy, that have budget within the next six months. That would be an example of a behavioral targeted marketing strategy where you could segment that, get a very specific list, and then send them focused and personalized content to better drive revenue and engagement with your brand. Um, I don't know about everyone in the room, but there is nothing worse than if you're on an e-commerce site or if you're on a, a B2B site and you're looking for something like tag management or, or content management and they're sending you something that is in a totally different realm of what you've searched for or what you've downloaded or what you have expressed interest. So I can't emphasize enough how important it is to truly communicate with your customers at that very direct and personal one-to-one -one level. So in short, before I, I turn this over to Jay to get into the, the demo and the technology side of how these platforms work in conjunction, I think the key thing to take away as you start to look at your evaluation process, obviously you want something, uh, an email engine that's going to be robust and incorporates uh, dynamic content and personalization and is able, uh, able to do so at scale. You obviously are looking for some type of lead to revenue or lead to conversion component, but you're also going to want a platform that is going to be able to pull in a variety of different customer behaviors so you can leverage that data in your outbound communication regardless of the channel, whether you're going to communicate via email, 
whether you're going to communicate with them over the web or whether you're going to use mobile and social channels to communicate and drive engagement with your customers. So that's all that I have. If you guys have any other time this afternoon, want to learn more about the Silver Pop Engage platform or our particular partner program, feel free to swing by our booth and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you guys have today. Thank you, Bobby. Now we are going to talk about integrating marketing automation services with Drupal. We'll talk about media currents uh, involvement with MA and Drupal, why you would even need a module at all. We'll demo a quick example of how to install a module that implements a third party service. And finally, we'll talk about um, the roadmap we envision for, for these modules going forward. Next, I'd like to talk a little bit about our company's involvement. We see that customers are increasingly interested in content strategy and marketing automation. Many website administrators and decision makers now are actually now marketers. And so clients are needing integrations for these services. When we started looking um, into the Drupal modules out there that were available, we saw that many were completely out of date or unavailable. Some of the biggest services did not have Drupal 7 modules. I would go to the developer websites and look around, look at the forums and things, and what I saw was a lot of people were doing custom integrations, but they weren't contributing it back to Drupal. And so we decided to take ownership of several of the major services, and we invested literally dozens of hours into bringing these modules up to date. So real quick, um, our goals for every module that we worked on was to get to a stable 1.0, you know, release for Drupal 7. We wanted to at least have the basic features that any site would want. And so that includes things like web tracking. A lot of these services have web tracking, event tracking. Uh, Bobby talked about some of that. Um, web form, we wanted web form integration so that uh, we could have uh, WebForm, the very popular form building tool for Drupal. We could have that integrate with these third-party forms and things. And so um, finally, we just put in some more time into updating documentation, updating the UX. And so we were able to do that for a lot of the major projects. You might be thinking, well, that's great, but why do I even need a module at all? Don't all of these services give you some kind of a script embed or something you know, just like if you're using Google Analytics or something like that, they'll give you an embed, right? And you could plug that in. You don't have to use the Google Analytics module. And you could really say that about any third-party service. And so, again, why would you need a module? One reason, one reason is that it's usually easier and faster to download and install a module. <coughs> While it's true that you could build out forms in Silverpop or elsewhere and embed them in your site with these script embeds and things like that, you know, sometimes some of that is easy, some of it isn't. The, the aim of these modules that we worked on, any of these marketing automation modules, is that uh, you shouldn't need a developer to uh, integrate these services, uh, to at least the basic integrations. You should be able to download the module, install it, configure it a little bit, and then you're good to go. You don't have to have a developer do something custom. And so these modules give you uh, several configuration options right from the Drupal admin screen. Several modules have debugging tools. They'll tell you if something's not working right, if you're getting some sort of an error, the API isn't firing correctly. Um, and I'm going through this because we get this question a lot when we talk to people. So another disadvantage is when you do a custom integration, if the API changes, uh, the embed gets deprecated. You know this happens all the time with anything third party. They change their stuff and it breaks your site. Well, if you're using a module, it's abstracted some of that so that hopefully you're just upgrading your module. You're not having to manually update all this stuff on your website. And the best reason to use a module um, is that it's going to be better integrated with the Drupal CMS. So, um, you know, our main example is that all of the modules that we've worked on are integrated with, um, integrate these services with the web form module. And so that gives you something that you wouldn't get um, if you did something custom. 
Now let's do a quick walkthrough of how you would install a module using one of the, the services. We'll use Silverpop as our example. And the other modules I've worked on do things similar. The UX is similar. I mean, configuration's a little bit different here and there, but you know, once you've seen one, they're very similar. So pull this up, and hopefully this will work. <laughs> okay. All right, so he here's the download page. Download, enable the module. <clears throat> we'll pop on over to the Silverpop settings page. And there's some configuration at the top that enables the web tracking on your site. So that's the cookie tracking, you know, that tracks visitors. You can set up event tracking where you can attract, you can uh, tie events to button clicks on the site. At the bottom was some API configuration. There's a tab where you can see all your, your web forms. And so we've got a sample contact lead form that I'm going to demonstrate. And so this is a web form. You know, it's collecting various information. Click on the web form tab, and we've got our little settings page for Silverpop on our web form. And so all we're going to do is, is map this web form to Silverpop. And so there's, what this does is it maps to a contact list in Silverpop that you set up on Silverpop. And then you're able to map each of the fields to Silverpop. And um, so it's, you know, it's pretty easy to set up. And so now you've got it on the Drupal side. You, you're using WebForm. You're doing whatever you want to do with WebForm. But it's also uh, generating a contact inside of Silverpop. And so that's just a simple example how to use one of these modules. Okay. Let's now look at the roadmap uh, we see for these modules going forward. There's a lot of movement right now towards uh, more personalization of, of website content, and Bobby talked about that. Marketers want to put the right content in front of the right people, the right prospects. And so we plan to leverage these services to power personalization um, of content in Drupal. And we've had talks with Silverpop people, and we're going to move forward with um, adding that kind of functionality with uh, these various modules. Another feature we see a lot of requests for is pretty simple, just pre-filling forms on your site. So, um, you know, they're doing these cookie tracking things. So you already know, if you're doing it right, you already know some information about your visitor if you're tracking them. So you can pre-fill form fields. We get that request a lot. And we're going to add even deeper Drupal integration. So more integration with Drupal content, Drupal users. Going to invest more time in the UX and documentation, things like that. We want to make it as easy as possible for even a non-technical user to download, who uses one of these services to download the module, enable it, some basic configuration, and you're up and running. And finally, we think it would be valuable to pull in some of the reporting from these sites. So if you're using Silverpop or whatever, so be able to pull in some of that reporting uh, via various APIs. That's kind of the roadmap as we see it. We're certainly open to you know, suggestion. So here are some, some links to some of the project pages on Drupal where you can find some of these modules. These are some of the main projects that we have worked on. And so we have made the commitment to keep working in this space. We'll continue to invest time into features, working with partners, certainly working with other people in the Drupal community to continue to improve these kinds of integrations. So that's it. I will pass it back to Adam. Yeah, so, so that's really that's really the crux of the presentation today. We we intentionally finished early. I know we were a, a few minutes early, about twenty minutes early. We intentionally finished early because we either want to take questions or we want to allow time for us to kind of break off and talk a little bit more specifically about your pain points. Um, so, two quick things I wanted to plug. Again, if you'd like to uh, to enter to win a copy of the. Market Automation for Dummies. You can buy it on Amazon, but we're giving copies away. Certainly stop by our booth, or you can see Don. She'll scan your badge, and we're going to give these away. Also, at our booth, we're doing these mini power sessions. I'm a really big advocate of, um, I like giving presentations like this, certainly enjoy speaking, but I really find that a lot of the times that most of the brain power and most of the actual, like, um, where the rubber meets the rose when you're having more 
uh, kind of casual conversations. You can actually write board things out and talk through things. So we're having these power sessions at our booth. They're 15 or 20 minute power sessions. And um, you can stop by, we're talking about SEO, we're talking about market automation, we're doing demos. Uh, so certainly see us 401-500 if you'd like to, uh, to attend that. So any questions, anything you guys want to talk through, anything specific around your marketing strategy you'd like some talk on? Yeah. As far uh, uh, what specifically would you? Yeah. Do you want to? Do you want to talk about? Yeah, that? I can yeah. address that. That's great. So we have a very good mic. Okay, perfect. I'll sit here and take that. So we do have a very good, uh, robust integration with Salesforce.com, um, as well as I think some of the other CMR, CRM providers that we integrate, Net, uh, NetSuite, um, as well as Microsoft Dynamics. But really, the, the core functionality behind our integration with Salesforce.com is that your sales team really has, there's two specific features. So the sales team has visibility, what we call, it's a, it's a technology term called contact insight. So when your sales reps are in their CRM, they're in Salesforce.com on a daily basis, within the CRM, they could actually see all of the marketing communication that has gone out to the specific customer. So they can see what emails they've sent, they can see what emails they have opened, they could also see what types of, of content that they've downloaded. So if you're a rep working for a content management provider and you see that they've downloaded particular white papers on content strategy and content management with um, marketing automation integration, they have visibility into that. So when they pick up the phone or they send an email and they reach out to that individual, it's more of a warmer conversation than just saying, hey, I'm Bobby, I'm calling with Silverpop, I wanna to talk to you. I can frame that conversation, hey, I noticed you had the opportunity to watch our video, our five minute video on the website on content strategy. Would love to carve out some time to talk a little bit more in depth. So it's a much more meaningful conversation in that respect. The other part of the integration that we have is what's known as a send from Silver Pop feature. So if marketing wants to go in and create, um, these are not very dynamic emails by any stretch of the imagination, but they're very, very specific and they're all controlled through the marketing department. And then you can send it, send a Silver Pop email within salesforce.com. So your rep can choose from a variety of pre-approved templates and send those out to their customer or prospect base to communicate with them as well. So there's some additional things that we can do that are a little bit probably more custom in nature. So if you have different requirements or if you're looking um, for more functionality in that respect, we could talk about that. But that's kind of how the core integration functions with salesforce.com. They are, yes. We see them quite frequently. Um, the, we see sorry, them on the, the question, side sorry, of things. The question was, is Marketo a silver pop competitor? Right. Sorry. Yeah, they definitely fall into that competitor category. Very good company. We see them quite frequently in a lot of the deals that we're in. Okay. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, we would be in that same conversation if you were evaluating those types of platforms. Great question. Yep. Okay. Yeah, so are you tracking like where they originated from? Yeah, so I mean, I, it would probably be very specific to your business, but I would say a, a specifically track where the original touch point was. So where they, where they originated from and at what touch points then did they, so let's just say you met them at DrupalCon, you would have them tagged as here's the original touch point. And then that doesn't mean that they've converted on your site. So as you continue to nurture them, what then, um, you know, I, I base rules of three, so drip campaigns on threes and then nurture them and then see what the conversion point was. And then, at a st and then you take a step back and look, okay, here's a six month view, here's where they converted. So that's really what we're gonna, here's the touch, touch point, here's where they converted on our site. And then over time, seeing those trends of where the conversion points were versus where the, uh, the actual originated point. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I can speak to that, how we handle it internally. So, yeah, sorry. Try to repeat kind of the question. Yeah, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm normally pretty good at that. But the question was, so could you, could you say it a little bit louder? I'm sorry. Yeah, if you want to stand, there's a mic right back there. Yeah, then. that'll be recorded. have a lead that has consumed a lot of different content and converted maybe more than one time, they've touched several different campaigns, maybe consumed a white paper, attended a webinar, um, requested a call to the website. Now you have five different marketers that are trying to point to credit um, for that particular uh, con lead coming right. into the system. My lead. And we want people to get attribution, but how do you handle that? There are several different models, the U model, first touch, last touch, weighted or a degrading model, and I'm just curious how you all handle that. Did you have some, did you want, did you, were you? Yeah, our, our approach is whatever campaign come, it comes in first, that, that rules all. So they, in theory, could go to a trade show, they could attend a webinar, whatever the first touch point is and whatever that's tagged as in Salesforce, that's the campaign that we attribute it to. Um, there's other factors that you look into that, but that's kind of the end all be all for how we evaluate campaign attribution in that. We're the same way. We didn't talk about this before, but we're the, we're the same way. First touch. Yes. Did you want to talk about Well, I can talk about yeah, it a little bit. Okay. So, yeah, that it's difficult to draw the line as far as what is a third party like Silverpop doing versus what's happening on the Drupal side. And so that line's a little bit blurred. Uh, certainly, services like Silverpop, they do a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, what I would like to see is more of the content stuff moved inside of Drupal. And so, um, and we've had conversations. I, I certainly think as far as doing personalized content, that you could move that into Drupal and so that you're not having to go to the third party where you have a lot of content parked there and it's getting generated via Ajax or whatever. I mean, that's okay and you can do that right now um, because there isn't like really a good Drupal alternative, but we are wanting to move that into Drupal so that you can build your content, build the roles, use Silverpop or whoever as your kind of decision making to know which content to show and so um, that's the way I've thought about it um, as far as personalized content. I haven't thought about it as much as landing pages and things like that. I mean, you know, there's, you're probably going to be doing both still, but um, we certainly want to move more of the, the content stuff back into Drupal. That's what we're trying to do. So for, for us, just to give you a practical <clears throat> example what we do, most of when we spin up quick landing pages, um, we do it within our market automation platform. Now, we just launched in MediaCurrent.com, and mm -hmm. it's much easier for us to spin up landing pages than it was on our previous version of the site. Um, but it's because that platform was just built for spinning up landing pages in less than 10 right. minutes, you know. Um, so, yeah, there, there's a little bit of back and forth, so that's where some of, like, we're working on making that a little bit more seamless. But you're probably going to be working in both at, at, right. at some point. Actually, to, to keep going on that, so as you grow your content, it's going to become more complex, more to manage. How would you suggest handling that as you get more on board? Um, expand on that. What do you mean, like, how, um, to, how so, to... So as you add more dynamic content, it gets yeah. more difficult to manage all the content that's live and it's out there. You know, how do you manage that? Is it tagging in Drupal? Is it people? Like, suggestions? I have my way. I don't know if you... If Silverpop has a... Well, okay, so... <laughs> That's a good question. So I'm trying to think about it from the Drupal side. So if you're, if we're able to move more of that content on, in on the Drupal side, we haven't thought through all of these difficult problems yet. <laughs> it's kind of the sh short answer, but I mean that's definitely something to think about because um, uh, you want to organize it in such a way that you can, you know, get to it easily. I guess I, I tag the content, right. right? So we have, and that's one of the things that we're again. I wish I could have more time to kind of set some roadmaps here, but before we started putting a lot of content in within market automation, we set up a, a naming and a tagging convention so that everyone on the team knows that if you're adding stuff, it's 
you know, image, colon, and then what the name of the image is. And so and then we tag it, whether it's a content strategy piece, it's a Drupal information piece. We have our own tagging system, and that's how we can then quickly go in and find um, what it is that we're looking for. We're going to repurpose that in another place. So, yeah. Do you, do you have a role for, like, how much content anybody can manage? Or? No, not since why. Throw it out there. No, I'm just <laughs> What else? Yes. Yeah, uh, heavily involved. Myself, <laughs> too our much, digital, really. Our, too much. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Myself, our digital strategist, and Dave, who Dave is one of the partners, um, has very marketing focused mind. We we took a step back before we even really started doing wireframes, before we started doing anything around our new site. We knew we wanted to take a look at who our buyers are, what questions they have, take a look at the the conversions on our current on our old site, and then really put together a solid conversion path, and then organize our content around our buyers. So not necessarily around what we think and what looks pretty, but exactly what it is that they're coming to our site looking for. So very... <laughs> yeah, heavily. Right. I haven't slept in six months. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Does that, did that answer your question? Okay. Um, I have a question for the Drupal end of things. Um, so... Have you ever thought about providing like a shared API for yes. session management? For oh, example, sure. using like the party API or some kind of userless user entity that could be used to integrate even multiple marketing platforms against the same uh, non-authenticated user? You know, well, so email. okay. Uh, well, I think I've got your question. So we've definitely thought about doing a shared API. Uh, a lot of these modules are doing similar things, and so. These different projects we've worked against have different histories of how they got to be where they are. And so our first goal is just to get what's there working, you know, stable and, and things like that. But when you take a step back, you would say, you might look at it and say, well, can we split off some of this functionality into some sort of a shared API module and really help us out on the maintenance side of things? And so if you add features to one service, then you can add them to others. I mean, that would be great. And, and I think. We're definitely looking at that sort of thing uh, because right now, right now it, it's a maintenance problem for these modules. Um, you know, the some of these services are kind of expensive, so there's not a huge developer pool out there to work against. So if we could certainly, if we can make the maintenance of the modules easier by having some shared code base, then I think we're definitely taking a hard look at that. And one other thing, have you looked at using the Flexiform module? Um, I, it's, it's a fairly new module. It's still in development, but um, it allows you to integrate like web forms and multiple different entities into one um, like very dynamic form builder API. Um, so it might be something to look into because it might be able to give you more power on top of the web form and okay. someone could create a user entity and multiple entities at once. And, send things in multiple directions. Yeah. Right, and re regarding forms, so there's several different form building tools. Um, could have done like entity forms and things or just the Drupal forms API. Uh, there's different angles you can take on it. We kind of just made a decision to say, well, web form's really popular, so let's just start there. Um, ideally, we'd be able to um, allow more kind of integrations with other kinds of forms and things, you know, in Drupal, so uh, definitely you know, consider that, consider that. Yep. Flexiform. Is that was that the module? Flexiform. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Is is there anything you can you should consider um, when working in Drupal uh, in terms of setup to make it more flexible to swap out marketing automation partners or vendors? Um, I know they each vendor tries to be all <coughs> inclusive, and I think you brought up the idea like with landing pages. You know, they like to take over ownership of all these, a lot of components which you might rather leave in Drupal. Uh, is there some rules, you know, rule of thumbs that you use to, to try to make that a little bit? Better? That's not a use case I've run into, but using a module is going to make that easier. Um, um, I'm trying to think. Yeah, so the, to summarize the question, it's kind of like, well, I guess... It, 
So you're using one service and you want to switch to another service. So if they're really tightly integrated with your site, then um, detaching from that other service, is that clear? Is that? Yeah, I guess, uh, is there a way for <coughs> Drupal to, to keep tracking the user behavior independently of, say, Eloquence? Well, um, you know, probably not. Share that cookie oh. and share that information. Yeah. So if you have a six-month sales cycle yeah. or an eight-month sales cycle and you don't want to lose all that information, yeah. You shouldn't lose that information, honestly. Like, if you have the tracking code installed on your website and you have the history, um, most marketing automation platforms, I don't want to speak for all of them, all right. but most of them, when you switch, they will migrate the instance of your current platform onto theirs. So yeah, you won't lose, lose any of their behavior, conversion points, or any of the integration. You shouldn't lose any of that. It won't, it won't detach you from still being able to track the users that you're at identity. No. You, and that should be a question. If you're th considering moving, you should certainly ask that and have them show you some examples of ways that they've done that. Because you shouldn't lose that. They should be able to migrate everything over. So. And so my argument for using a module as opposed to custom integrations is that, so let's say you're integrating you know, with your forms, your, your web forms, your Drupal forms, right, with this third party. Well, if you were just embedding their forms everywhere, then you'd have to completely rebuild them. Uh, there, there will still be some some work to be done if you're migrating from one thing to another. But if your if your web forms are all staying basically the same, you're capturing the same kind of information. Then that's less work to do if you're transitioning from one service to another. So that's another argument to me to use a module as opposed to just doing something custom. Yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so to, I think if I understand your question correctly, if you have an a example like Joe Blue and there's a ton of content that has to be produced and you just aren't there yet, what, what then do you do? So um, my suggestion would be you, you need to start off by identifying where the holes are on your current website. So you take your buyer personas, you figure out what questions they would have as they're coming to your website during their buying cycle, and you see what content that you have and then you start, you just, I mean, you know, let's just be honest. Like, you're not going to produce all that content in a week. But if you can start producing content that helps fill those gaps and then slowly keep interjecting, you know, I think the rule of thumb is just keep producing new content. Helps with SEO. Two or three blog posts a week. Our, our aim is two or three blog posts a week, one piece of gated content a month, whether that's a webinar or a white paper or an ebook. So we, most of the resources that we provide is just free, it's free for use, but there's usually one piece of content a month that we use to capture leads with. So, um, and that's a question that a lot of marketers have. That question and then setting up all these drip campaigns, it gets overwhelming. So my, I'm just say rules of three. Just focus on three things at a time. Of, um, yeah, to some extent, yeah, we do. Like, especially if we use um, freelance writers, um, we will put that into the the cost of producing that. Like, for example, an ebook or a white paper. We know what that cost will be. We'll add that into our marketing automation instance, and then as leads convert or a, an opportunity closes, we look back and to see, you know, what that cost to to lead ratio was. So, yeah, it's a little harder to track if we're having our internal team. You know, write blog posts, but um, you know, do the best we can. <laughs> Any other questions? Excellent. Well, f oh yeah. <laughs> so the question was: You they have a large a large number of products, and people download everything. And so your the question really it's hard to track what
Oh, yeah, we should probably take that offline. But, um, yeah, I mean, I would say that you would start with, um, I mean, to me, I would look at what was the first thing that they converted with because that's obviously what, what compelled them enough to give you their contact information. And then the way that we would do it is um, I would categorize that and then if, and put them kind of on a weighted scale. So if they're downloading content that's this category and they're downloading more of that content, I would probably drip the campaigns geared towards that category. Is it? Yeah. So, um, yeah, so, yes, there's an automation rule that you could create in Pardot um, that obviously you're tagging them. If they download this piece of content, you're tagging them with that product name. And then, yes, you can raise their score or lower their score and then create some automation rules that show what, what categories are being downloaded the most. That's actually a, a thing that I pitched to Matthew Sweezy the other day because I wanted to see where the main categories were of where our buyers are coming from. So, we should talk. <laughs> Any other questions? Great, thank you guys so much. Thank you, Sir Bob. Yeah, thank you, this is great. And again, if you want a, a copy of the book, you can see our friend Dawn over there and she'll scan you or you can come by our booth, so. Yeah.